Okay, <clears throat> let's go to God in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to study your word. Father, we appreciate the fact that we can, we can get connected like this. Even when we have difficulties in one place, we can go to another. And Father, we, we know that your, import, your word is important and we need, to, we need to be able to be able to, to get it out to be heard. Father, that's what we want to be heard today is your word, not anyone's bias, not anyone's thoughts on the matter, but exactly what your word is showing us about your word. Father, as we study these individual words, please help us to see the import of knowing your will, Father, and right down to knowing the individual words. We know, Father, that there are many false teachings out there, and sometimes that's done on purpose, and sometimes, Father, it's not. But all the times it can be taken care of by getting deep into your word and seeing what it says exactly. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. Ah, good morning, Rich. Good to see you. Okay, we are going to be looking at the word we're looking at today is the word, the Greek word that we have, angel. Angel is one of those words. Um, that I oftentimes like to point out in God's word. We, we noted it when we studied the word Christ, how Christ is a transliterated word. And I want to repeat what that means, transliterated. It, well, well, normally we, we, our words in our Bibles are translated. And what that means is, is whatever Greek word, if you're in the New Testament, and that's where we're going to be today, so let's just talk about the New Testament. Whatever Greek word you have, is translated into English, the equivalent English word for the meaning of that Greek word, okay? And so that's why, for instance, when you want to study, and we're going to be studying this, by the way, in one of our studies, when you want to study the word love, you know, you uh, we have, there's a couple of different Greek words for love. One of them is agape. Another one is philo. But each one of those translates into love, and we're going to study the difference between different words for love in the Bible and how we have the word love. We just have that one word for love in English, love. <laughs> and so we're going to study that sometime in the not too distant future. But the, uh, you know, that's translating a word. Well, when you transliterate a word, you don't, you don't translate it, obviously, but instead you just bring that Greek word, and not in this case, into the English language. Now, what problems can happen when you just bring a Greek word into an English into another language, into English, for instance, without translating it? What can happen? Misinterpretation. Yeah, misinterpretation. Mis yeah, you you know why that is? By the way, there's a logical reason for that. I mean, besides the obvious, the obvious reason of you don't know what it means. Therefore, this is the logical thing I was going to point out is that therefore it can mean anything you want it to. You, you just decide in English, this is what that word means. And this happens on a number of occasions with words from the Bible. When they are, when, and this is a scourge of, sadly, of God's word that has been put on when translators did not translate the words in the Bible. That's a common thing to do, by the way, with names. And even there, we run into a little bit of trouble because names in the Greek mean something. And so we understand whenever you have a name like Jesus, you, you want to know what does that word, that name, mean. And, English, and Hebrew words and, and uh, Jewish, Jewish names, I guess I should say, Jewish names had meanings, as, as did other languages of the day. Our, uh, our words today, our names, have meanings, but we don't normally pay attention to it. Someone who's getting ready to have a baby will oftentimes buy a baby book and to figure out what name they want their baby to be named. And, and oftentimes because of that can look and see, well, what does the name mean? Uh, as if that really matters because most people in, in English don't know what their names mean. My name, for instance, Albert. My name, uh, if, if, if you want to know what it means, it means illustrious through nobility. That's what my name means. You know, um, well, no one looks at me and thinks I'm illustrious through nobility when they look at me. You know, that's just not that's just not where someone's mind goes. 
quite frankly, I was named Albert because my dad's name was Albert and his name was, his dad's name was Albert. That's how we got our names. All right. It wasn't because of, because of they looked at us and thought we looked, we looked like an Albert and therefore we looked like that definition. Um, so, so I'm, I'm getting far, far afield here. The difference, the difference is when you translate a word, you understand what's being meant by the author of the book. When you transliterate a word, unless you know what that transliterated word means, you don't know what was meant in every case by the author of that book. Um, also, because, because of that, we can, we can run into false teachings. Um, uh, well, because sadly, some people do want to change God's word. All right. I don't want to put that on everyone who ever has a different belief than what the Bible says that they're doing it on purpose. But it is easier to do it on purpose when a word hasn't been translated. OK, there are certain teachings in God's word that uh, uh, that we need to understand what is being meant. Um, all of the teachings of God's word, we need to understand what's being meant. So let's consider this word angel. Now, no one who's ever been in my class before, so that means, Bob, you can't answer this question, and Julie, you can't answer this question, but it looks like we got 11 people watching on Facebook. Good morning, Jeff. Good to see you. And Janet, and Doris, and Bonnie. <laughs> I'm glad you're all here. Um, and Dot. Dot's watching as well. What does the word angel mean? And don't feel bad if you don't know. Okay. Angel, angel has a specific meaning, and it's because we don't know what the meaning is that we have some false teachings that go along with this word, some things that are not agreed with God's word. I don't see anyone on Facebook answering. Do you have anyone on Facebook answering, Julie? Mm -hmm. Don't feel bad. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, I was Pat, an adult. Pat has it. Oh, Jeff. Jeff has it. Okay. Pat, Pat uh, oh, Pat? It. Let's see. What, what's angel mean, Pat? Did you have your hand up? Child of God. No, not child of God. No. Not child of God. Now, Jeff gave an answer, and he's talking about a specific type of angel with his answer. His first word is, is the meaning of the, of the Greek word angelos, which is where we get angel. You can see where we get angel, can't you? Angelos, angel. Jeff, Jeff put in messenger of God. Okay? Right. Now... The Greek word means messenger. Yes, those heavenly beings that come down and speak to mankind or or do things for mankind. We're going to see this today, by the way. You know the you know the concept of an angel that's helping you. Sometimes they call them guardian angels. That comes from the Bible. That one does come from the Bible, not to the extent that people have made it today. But we're going to see that idea from God's word today. But De, uh, Jeff is correct. Those who are with God are messengers of God. But we have angels, messengers today. Remember, this was a common everyday Greek word. If a father sent his son to tell the neighbor something in the days of, of Paul the Apostle, he would use a Greek word saying, my son is my messenger. My son is my angelos. All right. Common everyday Greek word. Anyone who took a message to someone else was an angelos, a messenger. That's all the word means. Let me show you how we, how the word, the, the uh, word angelos sometimes is translated in the Bible. Go with me to Luke chapter seven. Luke chapter 7, verse 24. Luke 7, verse 24. The word angelos is here. And I, and I can almost guarantee, I doubt anyone has a translation that has the word angel in it. Look at what it says, Matthew 7, 24. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. This is Jesus getting ready to speak to the people of John. Well, John had sent two men 
to Jesus to ask him a question. Are you the one we're waiting for? Okay, that's what, G that's what John had sent those messengers to Jesus to state. But, oh, yeah, for those of you on Zoom, Julie put the interlinear on there. And what that what an interlinear is, it has it has the Greek word for each English word in in the uh, an in, uh, interlinear that's in English, uh, English Greek interlinear has the Greek word for the English word. Now, if those of you depending on on Zoom might have to get real close to your uh, to your uh, screen to see what it says there, but it has the Greek word angelos for messenger. That's all that angel means. Now in this case. Our translators didn't use the word angel. Well, why not? Well, because he didn't want to confuse the people. They, they didn't want to confuse the people. They didn't want to give you the idea that John had some heavenly beings who, from God, who were his servants, who went around tell, uh, asking people questions, asking Jesus questions. These angels worked for John, and, he, and they went. They were angels of John, messengers of John. Well, I'm happy that they didn't want us to be confused there. I wish they would have translated the word Angelos messenger every single time. I despise transliterated words. And remember, Christ is a transliterated word. I wish they would have put in what it meant instead of making up a word like Christ. Now we have to look and see what Christ means. Now, today, we're going to look and see what angel means. And it merely means messenger. There are a lot of false teachings out there because these servants of God, and that's really all they are. And, I, and quite frankly, I believe most people believe, even when they have ideas about angels, they normally see angels as working for God. But we're going to see that they don't only work for God, these messengers of God work for us. You realize that? People look at angels and think that they are something that we should, well, some people think they're someone we should worship. They're someone we should, they're creatures that we should, we should look at that are near divinity. Some people will look at them that way. These are, these are more holy than men are, angels are. You know, none of those teachings are accurate with God's word. Let me show you the problem. One of the problems they had in the first century. Go with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter um, one, chapter two. Colossians chapter two. We're going to be down around verse. Let's see. Not just around. We are going to be at verse 18. Okay. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Paul is in the midst, he has just told the, the, uh, the, the church in Colossae, uh, told them about the fact that the old covenant had been nailed to the cross, all right? And therefore had been taken, taken away, taken out of the way. We're no longer under it. And because of that, look at what Paul says we need to, we need to realize. Verse 18, um, let no one keep defrauding you of the prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Now he mentions a couple of different things there that occur when people are not getting into God's word and knowing God's word, but instead following the traditions or the feelings or the, uh, the ideals of man. Self-abasement is, is denying yourself things that God has never told you you had to deny yourself. One of the things in that day was the idea of not eating certain foods, all right? God has cleaned all foods. There is no restriction from foods within God's word anymore. There was under the old covenant, and that's what he had just shown, that the old covenant was taken away. But it's the second one I want us to note. He says self-abasement and the worship of angels. You see, the Jewish people, and for that matter, the Greeks as well, but since he was just showing the Old Testament had been taken out of the way, the Jewish people had a tradition about angels being creatures that should be worshipped or were nearly worshipped. 
Again, the, the Greeks had a similar, a similar concept. Um, in, in the book of Revelation, there's two different times that the apostle John fell down and worshiped at the feet of the angel who was showing him these visions. And both of those times, that angel said, don't do that. Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you. All right. I am not someone to be worshipped. Angels are not higher creatures um, near divinity that men should worship. Um, there's another false teaching out there that people become angels after they die. That is nowhere in the Bible. There is no such thing as people becoming angels after they die. You know, they, they um, twist yeah, Jesus, Jesus says that following the resurrection, we will be like angels. And he's talking about whether or not we will be married following the resurrection. I think that's in Matthew 22, if you, if you want to note that. But, but there he says that we would be like the angels as far as marriage is concerned. That's the closest thing that you will get to, to saying that people become angels after they die. And there he's talking about after the resurrection, after judgment day is what, is what it's going to be like. It's we will be like the angels, not giving in marriage, not being married. But, he, but the Bible never calls people who have died becoming angels. Angels are created beings. Angels were created at the foundation of the world, just like humans were created on the sixth day. The Bible makes it clear that God in the beginning was God, all right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, but angels weren't there. They're created beings. And so, so this idea of angels being anything but servants of God when you're talking about the heavenly ones, all right, comes about because of misunderstanding about words and uh, and. Uh, I, I truly believe many false teachings would have not gotten as much of a foothold in people's hearts if they if we would have just translated the word angel. Okay, um, let me give you one more. This is before we look at some other stuff. Go with me if you will to Revelation, Revelation chapter two verse one. Here's another place where I believe there's been a lot of of uh, misunderstanding. Um, uh, sadly, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, speculation that would have never been made if the Greek word had been. I'm sorry. What? The Revelation two, verse one. Sorry. Revelation two. That's okay. That would have never been made if we would have translated the word angel. Let me read this verse with the word translated to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, right? That phrase is used before every, every one of the seven letters that are directed at various churches in chapters two and chapter three, to the messenger of the church, right? Now, if that would have been translated, people would have looked at that and said, well, who could this messenger be? And think about how letters were done in that day. Whenever a letter was written to a church, Paul writes a letter to a church. Do you think everyone gathered around the, the letter and everyone read the letter together? Well, no, of course not. You would have one person, chances are there were a lot of people who couldn't read within a congregation. You had one person who would stand up and read the letter to the group. Go back to Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one, verse three. Look at what Revelation chapter one, verse three is. And I think we can pretty much see who this messenger is that's mentioned in verse one of chapter two. Chapter three, chapter one, verse three, sorry. Chapter one, verse three. Blessed is the he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Look at what he's saying there. It was gonna be written to the seven churches of Asia. Someone was gonna get up and read it to each one of those congregations. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear. Singular, he who reads. Plural, those who hear. Both are blessed. And so, and so notice what we see when we look at Revelation 2. 
You know, there's been, there have been doctrines taught that every church has its own special angel that, that looks over the church, guards the church. Uh, you know what? Quite frankly, who knows? There may be a couple of different angels that help, and not just a couple, many more than a couple of angels that help with a church because a church is made up of Christians. Now, this is one of the places I wanted to take you to as well. Go with me to Hebrews 1. Now, I'm actually getting out of order of how I wanted to do this, but that's okay. It's fitting with the way the lesson is going at the moment, so we'll go that direction. Hebrews chapter 1. I told you a little bit earlier that we were going to look at a verse. We're going to look at two different verses that give the idea of an angel looking out for a follower of God. This is what we see in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Start with 13. Start with, okay, yeah, we'll start with verse 13. Thank you. Because, it, yeah, they use that pronoun they. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 1, 13 and 14. Look at what it says. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And are they, angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Now look at this particular verse where a lot of people like to sit down and worship angels or consider angels to be near deity, to consider them people perhaps we need to be serving or praying to or any number of different things that people do as far as angels are concerned. Who's the servant in this verse and who's the one being served in verse 14? Who's the servant? Anyone. The angels. The angels. Are the servants who's being served? Christians. Yeah. Lord. Yeah. F no. Well, the Lord ultimately. That's a very good point. The Lord ultimately is being served, but they're serving followers the of God. Heirs of salvation. What's that? The heirs of salvation. There you yes. go. The heirs of salvation. People. That's who they're serving. And very good point, Pat. Ultimately, just like all of us, we're servants of God. Just like, that, just like that angel said to John in Revelation 22, when John went to bow down and worship that angel. Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours, of God. Worship God, is what he said. Don't worship me. Angels are not beings that deserve worship any more than any man on this earth is a being that deserves worship. But angels are the concept of guardian angel which has been blown totally out of proportion. There's nothing much in God's word said about it. Uh, Matthew 18 uh, comes close. Yeah, about yeah, and I'm going to go to Matthew 18. Linda also just put some on Facebook. Oh, what did she say? On Facebook? Uh, I thought, it, well, no, no, she sent a text. I'm sorry, not on Facebook. See what she said. I just saw it come in on my phone. Um, what it, another, yeah. the sun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Another well, teaching that comes out of this probably and likely one of the verses is that we each have a guardian angel assigned to us. Yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no, well, there's, there is one verse that gives kind of an idea like that, Bob. Let, let me mention what my sister Linda just mentioned since we're in Hebrews chapter one already. Go to Hebrews chapter one, verse uh, verse six, okay? And, and look at what the angels do, which is what we do. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now he's talking about Jesus Christ, okay? They are to worship Jesus. Well, that only makes sense. Jesus is God. They should be worshiping Jesus. We worship Jesus. Jesus is God. We worship God, all right? Now, the, the point that Bob was just making, go with me to Matthew chapter 18. Here is a verse that gives the idea that individual Christians, I would say the words, probably do have an angel who is looking out for them. All right? Maybe more. Who knows? But then again, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 gave an indication of that. But look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 18 verse 10. Context. Context is, 
He's trying Matthew. to tell. I'm sorry. Uh, did I say Hebrews? Yeah. Thank you. Matthew 18. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. It's on the screen. Ma oh, yeah. Matthew 18, verse 10. I said Hebrews. I didn't mean that. Um, well, while people are now going to Matthew instead of Hebrews, let me let me say this. Okay. Um, uh, the context, if you go all the way back to verse 1 and read through to verse 10, he's talking about how those who are coming to him who are like little children. He's not talking about little children here. He's talking about people who are coming to him who are like little children. They have become humble like little children. It is uh, that if anyone causes them to stumble, fall away from God, it is better for them to have a millstone put around their necks and thrown into the sea because God's going to really come down hard on someone who causes a new convert a Christian, someone who's coming to him to fall away. And then he gives this warning in verse 10 about those Christians who fall, who are, who are, uh, who are, who fall away. Hi, Jake and Badula and Becky. Very good. Bob and there's Doc. All right, thank you all. Good to see you all. Look at verse 10, what he says about people, the warning he gives to people who might cause someone to fall away. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my father who is in heaven. That's serious, That's serious stuff. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, and I don't want, I, I hate using the word because there's so many additional false, unsubstantiated, things that have been taught about people having a guardian angel. But I'm going to say it anyway. Let me, let me say it this way so I don't mess 10 minutes. Okay. So I don't, don't mess people's minds up too much. Their personal angels, it seems to be showing personal angels who are watching over people's lives, much like what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 1.14. Let me read that again. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their messengers, their angels in heaven, continually see the face of my father who is in heaven. Now God is all seeing, but that's also making it a point. And these angels are watching too. And they're going to be standing before God. And they're going to be telling God what happened to, to God's special little one. Again, if you look at the context, those little ones are talking about people who are coming to God, to coming to an understanding of, of what God wants out of their lives, all right? Um, he's not talking about little children, people who have become like little children. So, so and that, that's it. Those two verses are what you got. If you want two verses to talk about, quote unquote, guardian angels, I most certainly do not um, endorse 99.9999999% of the things that are taught about guardian angels, all right? Because they're wrong, okay? Um, but the fact that there are angels watching over people, there to minister to people in some respect, the fact that they're messengers. I like the fact that it's a messenger. Read verse 10 of Matthew 18 again with that word messenger. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their messenger in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. They report directly to God. Yeah. Do you see what you get when you have put the word messenger there? <laughs> They're tattling. <laughs> oh, that's a bad way of saying it. They're telling God what is going on. They're messengers. God, God sent them out to bring messages to him about what's happening. And again, if we would have translated the word instead of transliterating the word, perhaps even a lot of the teachings about guardian angels would have never been made. Who knows? But angels are these incredible d divine creatures that are holy and, and things of that nature. And they're going to be, you know, and again, it uses a lot of words. One of the words is holy. We're going to be studying what that word means. 
He uses that word in such a way as God's word doesn't mean it. Your, uh, What's Linda that? Linda says these personal Albert. angels. What? One second, Bob. I'm getting another one. One second. Uh, these personal angels seem to be more concerned about the spiritual needs of people instead of the physical. Excellent needs. point. Excellent point. Let me make That's that. Linda. My, my sister Linda says these spiritual messengers seem to be more concerned about the spiritual needs of the people they're watching over than they are about the physical needs. Notice again in Matthew 10, 18, verse, verse 10, it's talking about someone who stumbles. Very, very good. Very good point, Linda. Okay, Bob, go ahead. It isn't what the Bible says about angels that is confusion. It's what it does not say that, that gets people into trouble. Amen. Amen. This is, this is where we get into, into difficulties, when we, when we step past the bounds of God's word. I have no problem with someone in their personal life speculating what an angel might, might or might not do for them before God. I have no problem with that. If you want to see, by the way, a wonderful work of fiction that gives you, gives you some possible ideas of what angels might be doing, read the book, This Present Darkness, okay? Um, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. And, and it shows us it shows us some things. Can you find that verse real quick with a with Elisha praying that the servant's eyes be opened? I want to finish with that uh, because that right there, it, the this present darkness. I can't remember the man name who wrote it, um, but he writes a very good book that shows the possible angel working going on in the background when we pray to God or when we're when we're uh, you know. But again, it's a nice work of fantasy. But I'm gonna I'm gonna read I'm gonna finish this lesson with a verse from the book of um, Second Kings. Second Kings. Six, 17 okay, through 20. go with me to Second Kings, verse what? Seventeen to twenty. Uh, what what chapter? I mean. <laughs> Second Kings. Second Kings. Six. Six. Second Kings six, 17 through 20. verses seventeen through twenty. I love this passage. The prophet Elisha is uh, is. Um, in trouble, he and his servant, although Elisha doesn't see it as being all that much trouble, they're surrounded by an army, okay? The Amorites are surrounding them and, uh, and, and, and the servant is really scared. What are we gonna do? Um, in fact, look at verse 15, we'll start there. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, I pray you, I, I pray, open the eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Okay, now what's going on there? Well, it looks like there are angels who are surrounding Elisha, the army that is surrounding Elisha and his servant. Remember what Jesus prayed? If I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels to help me. What kind of trouble do you think that army was in? Inescapable. Yes. Yes, they had beings they certainly couldn't kill and they certainly couldn't defeat that were surrounding them while they surrounded Elisha and his servant. All right, there's a picture if you want one. What do we not see around us? All right, but the idea of many of the ideas about angels that we have are bogus. Many of the ideas that are taught about angels are suspect. Everything is suspect if it doesn't agree with God's word. We don't know exactly how they work or what they do. I like my sister's point. It seems to be they're more concerned about our spiritual needs than about our physical ones, all right? But be that as it may, they are not dead humans. They are not mere divinity. Um, uh, they are not, um, they certainly aren't things that we are should be, supposed to be worshiping. They certainly aren't, aren't things that uh, we should be recognizing are better than us. 
In fact, if you look at First Peter, I think it's First Peter. It's the first or second. Wait, wait. Go, yes, go ahead. What's uh, that? Uh, what in Kings? What passage was 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 that we just talking about? Second Second Kings chapter six verse seventeen. Second Kings six verse seventeen. Lost. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It's also on the screen, but you may not be able to see it, uh, it's Julie. It's very tiny. Yeah, it's very tiny on there. Um, as far as our salvation, the Apostle yeah. Peter, I think it's in 1 Peter chapter 1, says that angels long to look into these things, the fact of our salvation. You know why they long to look into the things of the fact of our salvation? There's nothing written that angels can be saved. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, you find out that angels who had sinned are waiting in chains, in torment, um, in Tartarus, waiting in chains for judgment. That's uh, 1 Peter 1.12. Oh, okay. 1 Peter 1.12 says that angels long to look into our salvation. And I'm convinced the reason for that is there's nothing in God's word that says they can be saved when they sin. Men are blessed, okay? We can be total mess ups in our lives. We can really mess things up. And Jesus Christ come Less down to die on the cross for our sins. Less than one minute? Okay, I need to wrap it up because we got less than a minute. But I love this study of angels. There are things that, there are things that are taught way too far about them. And we don't talk about them enough within the Lord's church. And we need to be doing it more because people are going to believe the false things if you don't talk about the true things. Let's go to God in a word of prayer and we're getting ready to lose Zoom. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father, for your servants who come to help us out, Father. We understand that you care so much for us and help us, Father, to realize just how much you do for us towards our salvation. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen.